Good morning, everyone. It's nice to see a full house this morning. My name is Kate Byerwalter. I'm an assistant professor of psychology in the behavioral science department here at Grand Rapids Community College. And welcome to the fourth annual child abuse prevention panel. This panel began four years ago as a collaboration between GRCC and the Child and Family Resource Council of Grand Rapids. Every year after the panel, we say, wouldn't it be great if we never have to do this panel again because there is no such thing as child maltreatment? That would be wonderful. But unfortunately, we know that isn't the case. In the United States alone, there are over three million reported cases of child maltreatment every year, and those are just the reported cases. So we can't ignore this issue. We need to continue to talk about it. We need to continue to educate ourselves about it. So to help us do that today, we have three terrific panelists with us, and I'd like to introduce them to you. First, we have Phil Hamburg, Program Director of Michigan Family Resources, Head Start for Kent County. He's also a licensed marriage and family therapist for the past 30 years, specializing in families with young children. So thank you for being with us, Phil. You're welcome. Also, we have Rosalind Bliss. She's the Director of Prevention Services at the Child and Family Resource Council. And I'd like to give a special thanks to Rosalind for inviting our panel guests today and coordinating the panel. We also have Pat Crum. She's a parent counselor and member of the Child Protection Team at DeVos Children's Hospital. So each panelist is going to speak for about 10 to 15 minutes, and then we'll leave some time for questions at the end. If you have a question, please raise your hand. I'll bring you this microphone so that we can be sure to hear your question. Thank you again for being here. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, I am fortunate enough to uh, get to talk about the most, I think, the most amazing part and possibly the most adaptive part of the human body, which is the brain. And uh, this panel, of course, is going to be dealing with abuse, and I want to talk about how the brain can be literally shaped by abuse uh, or the environment that it grows up in from a very, very young age. Most brain cells. Uh, are produced between the age of four and seven months in gestation. So when the baby is in the womb, the brain cells are, are rapidly dividing. At its peak, the embryo is, is generating brain cells at the rate of 250,000 per minute or 15 million per hour. The fetus has to do this because at birth, the brain and the child has to have 100 billion neurons connected by a thousand trillion synaptic connections. The normally born child, that's the child with no physical defects whatsoever, has all the brain equipment that they will ever need to succeed in life. Now, it's possible to have a brain and not have a mind. A brain is inherited. That The brain is all of the component parts. The neurons, the synapses, the glial cells, Brain is 78% water, 10% fat, 8% protein, 4% sticky cells to hold it together. Those are all the component parts of a brain, but a mind is developed. And, and for those of you who like to Google, okay, uh, and, and I know that a lot of you do, uh, Google sometime Bruce Perry, okay, the, the name Bruce Perry, P-E-R-R-Y. He has a tremendous website on trauma. And also, uh, for, for the more adventurous here, Google Reuven Feverstein, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, spell that, R-E-U-V-E-N-F-E-U-E-R-S-T-E-I-N. -E -E uh, he believes that intelligence is modifiable. In other words, if you're born with a certain intelligence, that is absolutely modifiable, which is kind of a unique perspective. And then one other reference that I'd like to give you today is a book called The General Theory of Love. And that book is written by three psychiatrists, which is a phenomenon in and of itself because I've never known three psychiatrists to agree with each other. <laughs> um, and and the, the first writer is Lewis or Thomas Lewis, L-E-W-I-S. That's really all you need, um, A General Theory of Love. That book talks about how brains assemble into minds 
and become feeling emotional systems. It's an absolute exquisite book for you scholars out there. <clears throat> okay. The mammalian, we're mammals, right? The mammalian nervous system cannot self-assemble. Many subsystems, like our limbic system, uh, in the mammalian brain do not come pre-programmed. Maturing mammals need emotional and limbic regulation to give coherence to neural development. The bottom line is love, nurturing, consistency, predictability, or the lack of all of these can change a young brain forever. Now, the lack of an attuned mother. Uh, what do I mean by attuned mother? A uh, mother who's responsive to baby's cries, who's loving, who, who touches the baby gently, uh, short response time, responds quickly, verbally stimulates, not screams. The lack of an attuned mother is a non-event for a reptile because they come pre-programmed. But it is a shattering injury for the complex and fragile emotional brain of a child. According to uh, one of my most favorite uh, dead psychiatrists, Dr. Kahn, it takes approximately 10 days for a baby to figure out if he or she is living in a safe environment. Ten days. Okay? How do they figure that out in ten days? The, the infant. How they're fed, whether it's regular. The response time, whether it's short. Cues are read by their caregiver. They're held, they're stroked, they're touched lovingly. They're verbally talked to. They, they, they maintain eye contact. And if this does not happen, if this does not happen on a regular basis, by one month, the child starts to feel unsafe and alone at the age of one month. If this continues, this neglect, the benign neglect, if by two months this continues, the baby already develops symptoms of stress, colic, sleeplessness, gas pains, muscle rigidity, uh, hyper alertness, tics, gagging response. And if this continues to four months, this kind of neglect, the child starts to see himself as a separate person. In other words, the child literally by four months starts to believe, I have to take care of myself. That's a bad thing. Khan calls this premature separateness on the way to becoming what we call now emotional preemies. Okay? Um, the child is not supposed to feel separate until the age of about 14 to 18 months. And children who are neglected at very young ages start to feel separate already by four and five months of age. I believe it's abusive to force a baby to become independent too soon, these emotional preemies. Uh, these, these separate emotional preemies become children then who are aggressive, non-trusting, hurtful children, lacking empathy, and see other people only as instruments. I'm going to just use you. Okay? You're, you're, you're not a real human being. You're an instrument. It's called instrumental relationship. To meet their needs. Uh, and, and, and the reason this happens is because the brain goes into survival mode if you have to take care of yourself from early infancy. A child will either have, now this is a trite saying, but I, I like it. A child will either have the power of love or they will have the love of power. The child will demand one or the other. So what I just outlined to you in just a real brief thumbnail sketch is how rage is born. I'm not talking about normal two-year-old temper tantrums. Two-year-old temper tantrums in a well-attached home is simply because the child is indignant that they are no longer God. Okay. This is, this is very different than an indignant temper tantrum. These are rage reactions, kids who have had to take care of themselves from infancy. And, and you can tell the difference because a raging child is a child, when you stop them from doing something, they want to kill you. Okay? In the period between zero and eight, oh, by the way, uh, the child only builds an intact conscience. In the, con in the context of a relationship. Children do not build consciences. Now, what's a conscience? If you ask a four-year-old what's a conscience, they'll say, it's my mom's voice on the inside. Okay? 
Children do not build intact consciences without the context of a nurturing relationship. In the period between zero and eight years, it is very possible also to sensitize a brain. It's called neural response sensitization. Uh, that's actually changing brain structure and brain chemicals. We have the capacity to do that from an environmental perspective. Uh, this is how it goes. Actual neural responses result from any sustained threat. In other words, if there's a threat in the environment, our neurons fire, okay, in the brain. Now, Bruce Perry talks about this in depth on, on, his, uh, on his website. And he also says over and over, brains are use-dependent. Whatever you use your brain for, that's what it will create more of. Okay? And it is, it is absolutely true. Um, so if a threat happens repeatedly over time, and I'll just give you a, a kind of a funny example. Let's say uh, little Jimmy in the morning. Uh, every morning, his mother, and I'll pick on moms right now, okay? Um, his mother screams at him every single morning. Get out of there! just absolutely just screams at him every single morning, okay? After about three months of consistent screaming at him in the morning, the brain reconfigures itself. The brain is capable of reorganizing itself by increasing receptor sites uh, for the alertness chemicals to handle screaming, okay? The brain actually builds extra receptor sites to handle the verbal assault and then the, the resulting survival pattern response, which may be a, a fight or a running away and hiding or a yelling back. Okay? So this goes on for three months consistently. The brain then becomes sensitized because it's built all those extra receptor sites. Now the really bad thing about this is that once the brain is sensitized, the, 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 the same neural activation can be elicited by a lesser stimuli. Let me give you the example. He gets yelled at, screamed at. He's got all these extra receptor sites to handle yelling. He walks into school one day, takes off his coat, throws it on the chair. Teacher says, uh, Jimmy. He goes, what'd you yell at me for? Because the teacher raised her voice just a little bit. But because he has a sensitized brain, all the neurons, all the synaptic connections fire because the brain is sensitized to yelling. We can change brains. Uh, so the screaming, abusive voice needs to trip... W w uh, wait a minute. A screaming, abusive voice was needed initially to trip the brain into survival mode. Now only a slightly raised voice will trip that brain into survival mode. The fear state gets brains sensitized and now becomes a trait. So, how a brain develops in the first five years of life is absolutely crucial. And what we're seeing is an enormous impact of the environment and how that impacts the brain. And abuse and neglect can severely impact brains. The brain is capable of being altered from, from zero to three uh, by a, a, a great degree. Brain plasticity between zero and three is huge. Parents can literally shape the brain. Between three and ten, there is a moderate plasticity of brains. Still very plastic, the brain uh, can be still influenced to a, a, a large degree. At about the age of ten, the brain becomes super dense with twice as many synapses as it is going to eventually need. So a massive pruning process takes place. That's why I think 11-year-olds are the toughest age to handle. Okay? Uh, but I can't prove that. Um, and then over the next few years, to the tune of 500 trillion synapses, the brain prunes those out. And after adolescence, the brain has a lower plasticity, still plastic, but it's, and it's capable of being influenced with a lot of work. So the bottom line is, the older we get, the less the environment may influence our brain, but the brain can literally be influenced to a degree all the way to old age, uh, for which I am thankful for. <laughs> uh, and uh, brains can, can 
therefore be influenced throughout the entire life cycle. And with that, I'll stop and turn it over. All right, thank you. I'm gonna spend just a little bit of time talking about uh, child maltreatment specifically in our community as well as uh, lead into some of the long-term implications of child abuse and neglect. And uh, then I'll hand it over to my colleague, Pat Crum, and she'll talk about prevention. What, what Kate said earlier about the prevalence of child abuse and neglect in our community and our society is absolutely true. Child maltreatment is without a doubt an epidemic in our, in our society. Just even locally, last year in Kent County alone, there were over 9,800 reports of child abuse and neglect. And the reality is that the vast majority of those, almost 60%, are reports of neglect. And what Phil just described is, is really frightening because the impact of neglect on the growing brain is dramatic. That when we look at the who are the victims in child maltreatment, so when you really analyze the numbers and look at the reports, what we find is that the majority of the reports that are made to Child Protective Services are for children under the age of five, even more specifically, children under the age of three. So the vast majority of the children who are being reported as being neglected are under the age of three. And we just heard very clearly that that is such a critical period for brain development. And here we have this enor these, these high numbers of children who are being severely neglected at, during infancy when the brains are so ripe for development. Uh, so that's just a really important piece to think about and especially looking at when we start working with children and looking at their behaviors to take that into consideration, especially when we're working with really high risk, at risk children, um, to understand where these children are coming from and having empathy for that. So I, I give you the numbers because I think it's really important to know and to understand what we're, what we're working with and what we're dealing with in the community. And child abuse or child maltreatment is is truly an epidemic that has an impact on all of our lives. And, uh, and in our professions, we work with it every day, uh, but it really has an impact on the community as a whole. There is a lot of research out there, and the websites that, that Phil uh, shared with you are really excellent websites. So if you have a chance to go to those, I encourage you to do so. But there have been a number of studies that look at long-term implications of child abuse and neglect. So we have a good idea of the types of symptoms or reactions that we see in young children who have been abused or neglected. And those range from being hypervigilant to being fearful, this inability to attach and to trust adults. We see it every day in every classroom in our community, particularly in Grand Rapids public schools. We see kids who are acting out aggressively. We see kids who are really struggling to sit in a classroom and sit in a seat and concentrate. We're seeing children who are afraid, they don't feel safe at home, they don't feel safe in the classroom. And the reality is, is that when you don't feel safe, it is very difficult to learn. And there, one thing that Bruce Perry states is that we're working with children who are often living out of their, their midbrain. <clears throat> so if you look at, at the brain, it's children who are really in a hypervigilant state, an emotional state, and they're not really living in the cognitive part of their brain where they're open to learning everything that we want them to learn um, in the classroom, like the math and the science and the reading. And, and so we, we really have to shift the way that we work with children, particularly children who we know are or have a history of abuse or neglect or trauma. So we really have to shift that, and we have to start working with children differently. And hopefully we'll get a chance to maybe talk about that a little bit. So going back to we, we have a good sense of the behaviors and the, the problems that we see when, with, with children if they have been victims of abuse or neglect. There have been a lot of studies that have come out over the last 10 years that look at the long-term implications of child abuse and neglect on adults and on our society as a whole. And I'm just going to share some of those with you because the numbers are really frightening. There are a lot of, a lot of different numbers out there, but some of the, the strongest statistics are with sexual abuse that there will be 
approximately 25% of girls by the age of 18 will have been a victim of some sort of sexual assault. Uh, you look at neglect and, and physical abuse and the percentage just skyrockets. Uh, so we're, we're working, at, even as adults, a lot of us work with, a lot of us have friendships with adults who have been victims of child maltreatment in some form or another. So uh, to me, one of the, one of the greatest long-term impacts of child maltreatment is exactly what Phil said, and that is that inability to, to trust other people and to, ve- to, and to develop healthy relationships, because healthy relationships are really key to being healthy adults, um, is to have a strong relationship with someone that you trust. And, and the inability to trust someone or to have a healthy relationship or to have a, a healthy social system uh, and support system impacts every part of our lives. It's such a critical part of, of who we are and, and how um, successful we are and how happy we feel and our own mood and our own mental health. So it's a really important piece. But if you look at kind of the, the nuts and bolts of the research, what we find is that when we do a uh, retroactive study or we look at retroactive studies where we look at adults and we look at how they're doing as adults, how they're functioning, and then looking back at their history and noting if they've been a victim of child abuse or neglect or some other form of trauma, and then you put the two together. Uh, There's a great study out there that looks specifically at this. It's called the ACE study. So if you're on your Google again and you're looking up, all you have to do on Google is put in ACE, A-C-E, study, and you'll pull up uh, probably over 25 articles that uh, relate to a, a, a significant study that came out of California. But I'll just summarize some of the data that they found. When they looked at at children who uh, had been abused or neglected 20, 30 years out as adults, what they found is that um, adults who had a history of child abuse or neglect, they were at a much greater risk of being dependent on alcohol, abusing drugs, of having uh, depression, other mental health problems, anxiety disorders, uh, having illicit drug use, being more sexually active, a higher rate of getting a sexually transmitted disease, more dependent on tobacco. Uh, They also looked at how they are physically. And what they found is that they have a higher risk of dying at a younger age, of developing cancer, having kidney problems, liver problems, of uh, of having other health-related problems as well as when they look specifically at relationships, there was a higher percentage of domestic violence and uh, divorce. They also looked at their kind of happiness or how they felt about their job, and they found that they were less productive in their jobs, that they were less happy with the work that they did, and overall, they, even if they had a job and they were functioning well, they just felt less, uh, less satisfied with the work that they were doing. So I think it's really important to look at not only are there immediate impacts on children, but there really are long-term impacts on our community and our society as a whole. In the work that I do, I work for a nonprofit, Child and Family Resource Council, and we're always being asked by funders to, to put, put dollar signs. Tell me monetarily what's the impact. You know, what are you doing? How can you justify the work that you do? So a big part of my job is to look at statistics and to kind of put them all together and, and, and be persuasive about why it's so important to not only respond effectively to child maltreatment, but also to prevent it. And for those individuals who really want to look at the monetary numbers, there's some excellent research out there about the monetary impact of child abuse and neglect on our community and on our systems. And, and the number from 2005 is that overall, within our country, annually, child abuse and neglect costs about $94 billion the, to respond to child abuse and neglect. And how they got that $94 billion is they looked at the cost of hospitalizations after abuse occurred. They looked at chronic health problems, which I just, I just talked about and touched on briefly. They looked at the amount of money we spend on our mental health system, on child protective services, on the court system in prosecuting these cases. Uh, they also looked at more indirect costs, 
such as special education. So we get a chance to, to kind of talk about how our school system is forced to respond to maltreated children. A big portion of that is special education and services that we provide for emotionally impaired children. Uh, they also, within the indirect cost, they looked at uh, mental health, health care, juvenile delinquency, then the lost productivity to society, as well as the uh, adult crime rate. Many of you have heard over and over that Michigan has one of the highest populations of uh, individuals who are incarcerated. That should be a huge red flag to us, that we are failing children. We are doing something wrong in our state when we have the highest incarceration rate. And we have got to start looking at what can we do up front in order to prevent these long-term impacts on our society. And that's really, in my work, uh, what has driven me and kind of led me to the road of prevention is the reality that once the abuse occurs, yes, we have to respond, and we have to respond effectively, and we have to have good systems in place for intervention, and we have to be able to help children heal, but how wonderful it would be if we could prevent any of that abuse from happening in the first place. And that, to me, is, is the answer. We have to do a much better job of putting our energy into early intervention. As Phil said, those first 10 days of life are critical, and we should be spending a lot of time and energy making sure that every infant that is born in our community and across the state and across the country is in a safe, predictable, nurturing environment. And so for me, that's really where my energy has led me, and that's the, the mission of the Child Abuse, or the Child and Family Resource Council, is to prevent child abuse and neglect. And so I'm gonna now turn it over to my colleague, Pat Crum, and she can talk some more about uh, child abuse prevention, what that looks like, and how we as a community can, can start really focusing on prevention. Thank you. Well, this is a really grim picture, do you agree? <laughs> But the good news is that child abuse is absolutely and completely preventable. What we know is that there are some qualities that parents come to adulthood with that contribute to the ability to abuse or neglect a child. And I'm, there are five of them. The first is unrealistic expectations of what children can do at their various ages and stages of development so that often parents are looking at an infant and thinking that they have intention or that they have thought patterns that they are completely incapable of having. <clears throat> so that's the first quality, that unrealistic expectation of what children are able to do. The second quality is a lack of empathy. And if children are growing up in that cycle of abuse or neglect and parents have not been attuned to them and have not shown them empathy, they have not had the opportunity to learn empathy. So empathy can be developed, though. Um, the third quality that often contributes to abuse and neglect is a belief in corporal punishment, a belief that in order to manage the behavior of children, we need to frighten them, um, control them. And that belief which is not always a responding in anger to a situation with a child, but really a value that responsible parents respond with corporal punishment to control their children. The fourth quality is role reversal. And in the situation that Phil described and Rosalind described when children are growing up in situations where their needs are not met, Sometimes as adults, when they are parents themselves, they're looking to somebody to meet their needs. And often they're thinking that children should do that, that children should respond to them, that children should care for them and their own emotional needs. So that role reversal, because children are really not able to take care of the needs of adults, sometimes results in abuse. And then finally, for some parents, as children are growing and developing, and their emerging will and their emerging independence can really be a problem for some parents. That um, attitude that you need to do what I tell you to do and that when you express your own opinion or your own will or as your independence starts to emerge that um, 
often that results in children being harmed. So if any of you are living with two-year-olds, you have the opportunity to see that miraculous period of development when the will becomes really obvious. For some parents, that's a problem. Fortunately, all of those things can be addressed. And I'm going to tell you about three strategies for preventing child maltreatment. And the first is that parents is a focus on parents and the fact that parents very early from the prenatal period need to be identified who are going to be struggling in their role as a parent. So already in the prenatal period, we need to have services available for parents to begin to prepare them and to prepare their attitudes and their knowledge about how to care for an infant and what it is that infants need from parents in order to develop. In the hospitals in this community, when children are born, there is the opportunity for parents to access services that will be provided in their home. The Healthy Start program provides those services. Parents are offered the opportunity to have a frequent contact from a home visitor, perhaps from a nurse who will provide them with child development information and provide support for them. That helps to do a couple of things. It makes some information readily available. It also helps to reduce the social isolation, which we know is a proven risk factor for child abuse. And then education should be available for all parents in our community. Years in the past, Parents were parenting in a community. They were not parenting in isolation. They were parenting with the elders of the community who had knowledge of child development because of their experience. They were um, surrounded by people who supported them, by extended family. But very often in our culture, people are parenting in isolation. And they don't have the wise counsel of the elders who used to surround the family. So all parents need to have access to good education. And that may begin in the pediatrician's office when they're given guidance as they go for their regular checkups for the child. And the physician gives them good information about what you can anticipate will be happening in the next period of time. You have a one month old, here's what you can anticipate will be happening in the next month. Um, you have a two year old, Here's what you can anticipate may be happening with that two-year-old in the next year. You may begin to see this emerging will. This is not a bad thing. This means they're right on target and that you've done a good job of getting them to this point in development. Um, this is what you can expect to happen. You can expect to see some tantrums. You can expect to hear them saying no quite frequently. You can expect that they're going to be explorers. They're going to be into everything. That's not misbehavior. It's how they're programmed. It's how their brain is developing. Um, so that kind of guidance in the pediatrician's office is very helpful. But beyond that, there are rich resources in this community for educating parents, uh, for helping them to understand development, but also to understand how their children are learning and what it is that parents can do to be effective in helping their children learn. Um, and also, when you bump into misbehavior, which all parents do, how you can respond in a way that actually encourages your children learning the life skills that we want them to have as adults. Another thing that's really helpful with the focus on parents is that because parents often are dealing with, uh, with a, a lack of resources and without a good social network, that there need to be places that parents can turn when they're in a crisis so that they can look for some immediate help. Another focus, other than on the parents, is on the children. Um, it is really helpful if there can be early screening for problems with children, if we can notice early on that there are some deficits in their environment that they're struggling, that perhaps they are children who are unattached or who are aggressive. Um, if there can be early intervention for them, that will be very helpful in terms of their long-term outcome. Another thing that's really helpful for the focus on children 
is early quality child care, not only for parents who are working and need that kind of regular care, but also for parents who are parenting full time and need a break from those responsibilities, from the stress of those responsibilities. And so places like Head Start, where children can be away from their parents for part of the day and in a setting that is enriched and where the, the whole focus is on helping those children to develop some basic life skills and focusing on their early learning is a really uh, great strength in our community. So it's beneficial for the parents and it's also beneficial for the children. And then for those children that we have identified as being maltreated, we need to have very effective programs for responding to them and intervening with treatment for them early on so that uh, they can be helped and taught and educated and supported so that we can break the cycle of those children growing up to become the, the parents of the future who will continue that cycle of maltreatment. And then finally, we need to make sure that not only are we addressing the needs of parents and the needs of children, but that the broader community is educated about the incredible, serious problem of child maltreatment. That as a whole community, we are aware and committed to prevention. So public awareness campaigns that bring our attention to the seriousness of this problem in our community are very important and will ultimately contribute to the prevention of child abuse. Thank you very much. Before we get to questions, I'd like to have us just give a round of applause, please, to our panelists. Also, before we begin questions from the audience, I wanted to give you an opportunity if there's anything you wanted to add as you heard the other panelists speak. Um, or anything else before we move to? Maybe just one, one comment about what you were talking about, Pat. I, I, I only want to emphasize it, and that is that the mentoring piece, I think, is absolutely essential because um, you know we've got wonderful educational programs, um, but a lot of people won't come to those. And so the mentors end up going out to them. Um, and, and that whole mentoring piece on a one-to-one -one basis is really important. Finding those, those mentoring elders, I think, is an uh, absolutely fabulous thing. You know, helping our, our, our younger relatives being a, a, uh, a mentoring elder, I think that that's really the, a key issue. I, I just wanted to add on as well something that Pat said about historically the shift that we've seen and how children are cared for and when children were raised uh, you know a hundred years ago or a couple hundred years ago when there was the family or uh, a tribe uh, some might say uh, when there were lots of family around to help raise that baby that baby was often rarely left laying in a playpen for hours because they would be passed from one adult to another and so they were held more often they were touched more often there were more opportunities to connect with uh, with adults and it's really been a, a significant shift as adults get busier and as they start as we're parenting in isolation uh, to not have that kind of support uh, and you, and so we're seeing we're seeing now babies will go hours and hours without being touched and the, even if we just look at the the number of hours you know babies were held and picked up and touched today compared to 60 70 years ago we'll see a significant difference and and that touch and nurturing is so important to brain development and to building healthy healthy babies and it's impossible impossible to spoil a baby yes. under the year under one year of age totally impossible. You can pick them up, touch them, carry them around with you. That first year of life, it is impossible to spoil a child. Thank you. Questions? Given that, that uh, younger, 
parents and single parents are particularly vulnerable for, for difficulties related to maltreatment. Has there been any work to get this kind of information into high schools um, around uh, you know, parental education prior to a time when people might start becoming parents? There, there are there are some great programs in our community that that do that that really focus on high schools. Uh, I would say that we we probably have a lot more work to do, and as Phil said, we can provide education programs, and I think that's a really key component. But what we really need to do also is have a multi pronged approach where we provide education, but we also provide that support and we provide a mentor and we provide really one-on-one -on -one contact with those families and with those new parents. Uh, so uh, I think there's more work that needs to be done and unfortunately what we're finding today is that uh, with, with the funding struggles that we're experiencing in our community uh, at actually every level of government, the federal government, the state government, locally, what we're finding is that where, where do we cut first when we have budget problems? We cut from prevention, unfortunately. It's really, a, uh, to me, one of the worst decisions we can make as a community, but that's the reality of it. And so prevention dollars and those early intervention dollars are really under the gun right now as we look at these pretty severe budget cuts that we face. And I know uh, Phil might be able to elaborate on Head Start, but Head Start is one of the one of the few programs in our that in our community and, and across the nation where there's solid research to support the positive impact it has on children and it is very often on the cutting block um, when it comes to budget and and decreases in, in budget yeah so. and and one of the things that Head Start does is that we have we have a social worker in every site and what we do is we work with the families not just the children so that um, uh, because we know that academic performance, which is actually the goal of Head Start, to get children academically ready for school, academic performance emanates from, comes from the family structure and the safety uh, of the child. And so, uh, you know, I think we do as well as we do in terms of cognitively educating three and four year olds because of getting these young parents and involving them on a monthly and a weekly basis in a nurturing process um, and uh, but high schools are doing this but again high schools are you know it's a cognitive process in a high school and sometimes it doesn't connect with with the young people who haven't had a baby yet uh, and they don't really realize it and so it stays up here and so it's very difficult sometimes to to teach nurturing without being a mentor process uh, as, as, as the child, or as they start to have children. What may be as effective or even more effective than actually teaching parenting in high school would be making sure that every young person has some adult that they are connected with who's paying attention to them and yes. mentoring them, yes. and it's in the context of that relationship that they will learn the give and take of a nurturing relationship. And that then will have a long-term impact when they're actually dealing with their own child. When their own needs are met, That's right. they will have a much better chance of being an effective parent. Right. You can't give what you don't have. Right. That's right. Yeah. And in, in regards to education as well, um, research clearly shows that there's a, what they call a magic moment. And what Phil said is true is that when we provide education that's not really relevant to an individual's life, it it doesn't always sink in. And so what we want to do is we want to provide really directed education when it's most relevant to an individual's life. That's why we find a lot of prevention programs or a lot of education is given to parents before they even leave the hospital because that, that 48 hours when a, when a parent is in the hospital after they give birth is considered one of those windows of opportunity or that magic moment when they're receptive to having information and getting information about infants. Other questions? After a child's brain has increased all these receptor sites in response to ongoing abuse, 
if the situation changes, what happens to those receptor sites? Do they disappear or are they permanent? Mm. Good question. It's, um, the brain can be sensitized, build these extra receptor sites, uh, increase the chemicals. However, it is reversible. However, but there's a real nasty little caveat in this because it is only reversible if the child's environment is completely safe, which means that you have to control for every environment that child goes in. Grandma's house, your house, the school. So if they get, let's, let's go back to that screaming example. So if they get screamed at, at, at grandma's house, but you stop it at your house, and it, at, well, we don't do it at school, right? Um, but we stop it in every other environment, but grandma still screams, the receptor sites won't, won't dismantle. So that, so that, but if you can control the child's environment for absolute safety, for let's say screaming, he never gets screamed at again, the brain will literally start to dismantle those receptor sites and flush them away. Other questions? I had a question about um, just activism. If someone's listening today and they want to become more active or they want to help increase funding for some of these programs you're talking about, what would they do? Well, I can only, I'll speak for my agency, which is a Head Start program. We've got 1,600 and and uh, 27 children in Kent County that we, that we uh, provide service to. That's a lot of kids. Those are all those little mini buses that you see flying around the city here. Um, we're always in need of volunteers, always in need of volunteers. Um, volunteers to uh, work in the classroom directly with the children, volunteers at parent meetings, um, and we, we could always use uh, the volunteers. So that, that, that's something that we, we're always looking for. I'll, I agree. I, I'll talk just briefly about my agency, the Child and Family Resource Council. We re rely very heavily on volunteers. We have a number of prevention programs. One of them was, is Healthy Start. Another one is um, EFF, which is Encouraging Family Formations. We have another one, uh, Strengthening Family Formations. We have another program called Connections, which, we, which is available to any family who uh, gives birth in Kent County. And what it is is it's a, it's a program where we provide uh, ages and stages questionnaires to families. They fill it out on a child's development. We score them. We, uh, if any potential developmental delay is identified, we'll respond to that and provide referrals. And families can stay in, t in that program for up to five years. Uh, we also do, we go into schools and we do prevention around dating violence and sexual assault and creating healthy relationships, which we know is absolutely key uh, to prevention. We do a lot of community education, so we rely pretty heavily on volunteers to work in all of those programs. So volunteering is, is a, a really important one. I know a lot of nonprofits rely on grant funding. Um, many grants come from our federal government and our state government. So if you, I encourage everyone to have a relationship or at least have some contact with their elected officials and to let them know that if this is something that you care about and that you think should get funded, then to make that known to your legislators. And to me, uh, a big part as well is simply having conversations with your friends and your family and, and, and talking about the issue of child maltreatment, but also creating an environment that is safe for kids, no matter where we are, whether we're in a grocery store or a park or a coffee shop. Uh, we have got to start being much more aware of how we respond to children and the environments that we work in and live in and, and uh, interact in, how we are responding to children. Are we ignoring them? Are we, are we acting as if they don't exist? Are we uh, making eye contact with them? Are we smiling? Are we responding to them in a way that would make them feel safe? Or are we giving them dirty looks? Or, you know, we just have to be much more aware of our own, of our own individual and how we respond to children. Uh, so I, th I think there's lots of things you can do. And those are just some great. I think there are a wealth of opportunities for getting involved so that if this is an area of interest, there will be no difficulty finding a way that you can make a contribution in this community. Um, in addition to being aware of children and how they're being treated and how we're responding to them, 
think we also need to be really aware of parents and that parents are often, um, they're stretched, they're having financial problems, they're trying to work and juggle parenting and maybe school too, and that um, we need to be aware of the sensitivity with which we respond to parents. Very often when parents are struggling in public, it's so easy to be critical of them when we could offer support and empathy. So I think in addition to being sensitive to children, and certainly we all need to look around and see where are the children who are not getting what they need because they are our future and we need to make an investment in them. But we also need to be sensitive to the parents who are struggling to do the best job that they can. It still amazes me how many parents feel utterly alone. Yeah. Absolutely alone. And, and you know, we're, we're in a room full of people right now and you say, hey, they've got people around them all over the place. You can have people around you but feel absolutely alone. And when you feel alone, you're vulnerable. What's the most effective way to discipline a child? Oh, can I take that one? <laughs> yes. <laughs> the most effective way to discipline a child is prevention. It is preventing misbehavior in the first place. And one of the primary ways that you can do that is by creating a positive environment, giving them a lot of positive attention before misbehavior ever occurs. Because children are in a constant process of trying to determine how to get our attention. And when you think about those parents who are stretched and pulled in so many directions, sometimes it's really a challenge for children to get the kind of focused attention that they're looking for. And in response to that, what they often discover is that when I misbehave, mom puts everything aside and she really zooms in on me while she tells me what she doesn't like about what I'm doing. So the very best strategy, positive attention. Yes. Can I, can I give you an example of that? The, the two-year-old, okay, toddling around your house, telephone rings, you answer the phone, it's your best girlfriend, okay, and you sit there talking. The two-year-old immediately goes into what we call decathexis. They feel alone, like, uh-oh, mom's gone now. She's talking to her friend. What do they do? They go into the flower drawer, start pulling out the flowers and, and spreading sugar all over the floor. Mom goes, uh, I, I, I've got to go. And the child goes, yeah, I got her back. Okay, So that, that kind of positive uh, connection and to, and to really develop in the child a a knowledge that they are being held 24 hours a day, seven days a week, emotionally held, is a huge deterrent for, mis uh, for inappropriate behavior. Because you're developing then the picture on the inside of, of the nurturing mother, and you're developing a, a full, intact conscience. It's scary how many kids are not developing intact consciences today. Great, thank you. I wish we had more time for more questions, but I'd just like to say thank you so much for joining us today, and thank you all for being here.